through everything. Um, so it's an introduction to um, uh, a metaboanalyst, and then you guys are get, getting the rest of the afternoon uh, to, to work on a metaboanalyst with the data that you've, you've uh, generated. And as I say, towards the end, if people are interested, I could do a, a very short 25-minute talk on the future of metabolomics if you want it. So what we're going to do is, is, first of all, introduce you to Metaboanalyst. So this is a software tool that's been around since 2009. And Jeff Shaw, who is here, is the guy who um, has, has written essentially all of it um, and is now in version 3. Um, so we're going to get familiar with it, and then we're going to uh, look at how you could analyze uh, NMR and GCMS and LCMS metabolomic data. Now I'm just, maybe I should just... I'm wondering if I clicked on the wrong. Hang on as I double check here because I've got two things. Oh. So I'm just bringing up the right lecture here. <laughs> So we're going to go through the standard data analysis workflow. We're going to look at <coughs> issues related to data integrity checking, outlier detection, quality control, normalization, scaling, and then we're going to in dive into metaboanalyst. So this is the example that we've given and you've seen before about how a typical biological metabolomics experiment will be done. You have treatment and control or untreated and treated. You'll have within the treated many biological replicates. Within the controls, you'll have many biological replicates. And some people will also take technical replicates. They might take double blood samples. They might take uh, a single blood sample and then aliquot it into several aliquots for follow-up uh, duplicate redundant studies. But regardless, you're generating lots and lots of data uh, where you're measuring hundreds of compounds or features or thousands of features uh, per sample. We talked about the two different routes to metabolomics before, the, the chemometric, untargeted profiling methods where identification isn't a major focus. And then we talked about the other one, which is quantitative slash targeted or even untargeted, where feature identification and quantitation is, is central. So the traditional older style chemometric method, there's a lot of data integrity check, but it's also true with the targeted and quantitative methods. Now, where they start to differ is that the spectral alignment or binning, which you guys did in XCMS, becomes very, very important. That's the first thing you do in a chemometric method. In the targeted method, the first step you do or after the data integrity check is this compound identification and quantification. That's what you guys did in Basil and also GCM, GC AutoFit. Um, there's a next step, which is data normalization. This is to convert sort of skewed data distributions into normal Gaussian distributions. So that's done both with the chemometric and targeted methods. There's the data quality control check and outlier removal. That's also done in both chemometric and targeted methods. Then there's the data reduction and analysis. That's the PCA to try and reduce dimensions and then to start generating pathway less and, 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 and uh, interpretation. In the chemometric, the compound identification is moved to the last end because by then you've presumably identified what is important. And I think again, people who did the XMS exercise will have seen that the last thing that you see is this table which then shows you your putative compound identifications. But often those are identified as being the most significant features and then it's sort of up to you to figure out what the compound is. And as you saw with XMS, you get anywhere from 10 to 50 different possibilities. So that's the difference between the work two workflows and you guys now have experience in both. Um, so now we'll dive into this issue of data integrity, data quality. Um, so one of the challenges with uh, LCMS and GCMS is they have a high number of these false positive peaks. So these are either noise peaks, uh, they could be fragmentation, neutral loss fragments in LCMS, they could be different um, derivatives uh, that happen with GCMS. Uh, you'll get issues with adducts, both with GC and LC. Um, you'll have isotope peaks. Um, 
there are also these ionization issues that can happen, and then there's just standard noise that shows up. NMR, interestingly, doesn't have those problems, and that's because it's such a relatively insensitive technique. Um, anyways, identifying those uh, features and adducts is something that you can handle with um, using replica studies, where you have the same sample, a technical replica injected, and then the adduct calculators that we talked about the other day, and which you also saw in XCMS that show um, different adducts that, that correspond to the same mass. We also saw the issues of data and spectral alignment. That's part of that workflow that we talked about. Uh, it's very important for both LC, but not so much for GC, um, because there isn't as much variation. But you can see in this example here where we have uh, two LC runs where there's a systematic shift, and then you can essentially shift things, realign them, and now you get the red aligning with the blue. So the XMS does that, MZ, MZ Mind does this, Chroma does it, uh, and the methods are usually these time warping algorithms. Again, this is a bit of a review. Um, you can also um, bin samples, and this is something that's an older technique um, um, and was done because of essentially data storage limitations on older computers, but it, it's still legitimate and it's a way of just carving up spectra that are very data rich or peak rich into into regions. Um, so these could be retention time regions, so this could be time or it could be in NMR spectra, it could be in a PPM scale. Other aspect that we talked about as well uh, in the statistics lecture actually was about scaling. Um, scaling things up or down sort of to match, to deal with dilutions, which is a problem particularly with uh, urine samples. But um, and that normalizing or scaling uh, can be done to total integrated area. It can be done to some kind of internal standard. So creatinine is often used as a standard in urine. You can use um, specific gravity. Um, weight or volume can also help uh, if you're working with sort of solid samples like tissues. Um, and and it, it depends. It's dependent on the sample. It's dependent on the circumstances that you're working with. And so it's really a matter of having some intelligent design. Um, that scaling can also be done to a certain feature in addition to or in, instead of total area, total peak height, or whatever. Um, sometimes you'll see in these examples where there's some you know, largely identical spectra showing up, but then you've got this one giant feature, um, which either you may want to get rid of or, or handle it as, as, as an outlier. Um, in terms of normalizing things to make sure that there's a distribution that, that's following a normal Gaussian um, shape. This is where you can also use things like log transformation, what we talked about. Um, and then there's Pareto scaling or range scaling. And again, those are things that are either handling intensity or distribution. And this is, as I say, normalization um, can mean two things. Um, quality control, outlier removal, data reduction. Um, we saw some examples of where there's some um, outlier removal data filtering. We get rid of solvent peaks in NMR. Uh, we can do some noise filtering, which is also often done in, in mass spec, GC, LC, and even in NMR. Um, and then the outlier removal, it's something that you just don't simply take an eraser to. It, it, it's something that you have to justify in your methods as to why those were done or why you chose to do that. Um, so again, these are all parts of the steps that I showed in the second slide of this series. And then the next steps were the dimensional reduction feature selection, uh, which we've gone through when the statistics done, and then clustering, which was this hierarchical or k-means clustering. So that's a quick overview of the steps that are done. So now I'm going to use or show how this is done typically in Metabol Analyst. So, um, this is a web server, um, and the website is given here, and it's now in version 3. Um, and it was designed uh, to allow people to do online metabolomic data analysis and reduction uh, for LCMS, GCMS, and NMR. 
Um, maybe just a quick question. How many people have used MetaboAnalyst before? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so maybe a third. Um, so the history is that it uh, was first introduced in 2009, and it allowed multivariate and univariate processing, ANOVA, T-TEST, PCA, PLSDA. Um, in 2002, uh, there's a big enhancement which allowed it to look at essentially pathways um, and to integrate some other tools that had been initially um, developed on their own, but then were more, more further integrated. What we found is that shortly after the introduction of version 2, we had a huge spike in use. We went from a few thousand users to a month to, what is it, about 50,000 users, which was sort of like what happened yesterday when everyone hit the uh, same servers. So uh, Jeff spent a good chunk of 2014 uh, rewriting everything so it would be able to handle the, the heavy use and also moving it to uh, a bunch of mirror servers. Improved things because R has improved a number of functions and, and new tools as well for the web. We've also added a biomarker analysis tool, power analysis, which allows you to calculate how many samples you need. And then it's also been integrated with gene expression data, which allows you to go across to other omics fields. So uh, each time we make an improvement, we get another few thousand users added. So and it'll be back to the drawing board of trying to make it even faster. Um, so we're going to go through data processing, data reduction, uh, we're going to go into functional enrichment analysis, metabolic pathway analysis. So the functional enrichment is sometimes called metabolite set enrichment analysis. We'll talk a little bit about power analysis, sample size estimation. We'll go into biomarker analysis. We will lightly touch on integrated analysis. So there's several modules in MetaboAnalyst, um, eight in total, and you can choose or click on those to... to to jump into them. The general path that you use in Metabolized is first to do some pre-processing of the data, cleaning it up, fixing it up, looking at it. Then we get into this normalization thing which includes both scaling as well as making it more Gaussian. And then you get into the data analysis which is the multivariate statistics. And then you get into the data interpretation which is the pathway or metabolite set enrichment analysis and hunting around, linking to databases and PubMed, and reading more about what you found. So this is another way of looking at it, um, a flowchart that, that Jeff has used and I think was used in the last publications. Um, so some aspects, uh, these are the, the raw data, so it would be peaks, it could be spectra, uh, it could be concentration tables, and we'll be using primarily concentration tables, not your raw spectra. Um, the, um, then there's that pre-processing step, which is marked in red, so there's that name mapping. So if you've got the concentration tables, um, it means you've got concentrations of metabolites, so you want to make sure you're using the right name, so you haven't misspelled leucine, or you haven't chosen an obscure name for hydroxyisovaleric acid. There's a data integrity check, so, you know, are these values actually consisting of numbers, or do they have the words NA or not a number, um, uh, where you maybe have to make sure that these things actually have real values. Um, in the case of peak um, lists, there's peak selection, peak alignment, but that's something you guys won't have to worry about today. After you've done the integrity check, there's the data filtering to get rid of perhaps either noise or spurious peaks, and then there's scaling log transformation for normalization. That's the pre-processing step. And then you have the choices uh, within those modules to do statistical analyses, that's multivariate. Time series analysis, we won't do that today. Uh, biomarker analysis, which we will. Tabulite set enrichment analysis, which we'll look at. Pathway analysis, another one we'll do. And then we'll briefly touch on power analysis. The integrated pathway or um, integrated sets with um, genomic information is another one which we won't have time to go to in today. So if you type in the URL for MetaboAnalyst, this is what you get. Um, so it, it's structured, uh, there's you know, updates, uh, some citation information, there's a left column which uh, I, I, it gives you some things that you can highlight or select on. 
But really to get started, you have to click on Welcome. Click here to start. This is actually one of the more confusing things about Metabolanus because it's relatively well hidden. Everyone's looking for, expecting to dive in. And, and um, we might have to get a flashing icon that tells you to click here to start. Um, <coughs> anyways, um, if you do start, um, you can actually dive into some examples, um, data sets that you can work with. And there's a number of examples that you can play with. And in fact, we will be playing with example data set. Um, and the one that we'll be working with uh, is um, a set of concentration tables collected for cows that were being fed on different levels of um, grain in their diet, uh, at least for this first batch. Um, so in this early step, that's the red part in our flow chart or the data processing and pre-processing. When you're doing data processing, you're, you're basically um, trying to convert your raw data into data matrices or tables. And as I said, the one that we'll be working with today is, is concentration tables because that's what you guys have largely generated from your <laughs> basal, the GCMS, and then even from your XMS data you have maybe not absolute concentrations, but you have tentative metabolite identifications and, and, um, and relative concentrations. But Metabolites can also work from peak lists, it can work from spectral bins, it can also work from, from raw spectral data. Yes? Uh, yeah, I don't know, is it, did that fall out of version 3 now? You, you won't have an example. I don't think there's an example set there, but you have to yeah, yeah, choose yeah. browse a file, select it. You go to the upload, there's a, you can select the raw spectrum, but I don't have this on the example data because it's not well supported. Usually, I, I use people say that I have raw, big raw data. Where should I go? I use to just go to XML. That's the reason. So, just going back then, I guess, in terms of um, if we've identified this data, in this case it was a table of, of concentrations from cows on different diets, we've selected a set, um, um, we've indicated what type of format it is, um, and we also indicate which ones, where the, the samples are, whether they're listed in rows or in columns. And, uh, that's, that's you see in that kind of screen, is an MS vector, they're all so just for those who missed it, so Jeff is saying that if you wanted to upload your own raw data for MS, MS uh, you could just click on that zipped file and click on the MS spectra. So we could upload the files, um, or as I say, if you wanted, in this case, using the example data, which is what we're using, you could go to the test data, and this is the test data that we'll actually be using for the example I'm illustrating. <coughs> so, two different routes. What you guys will be doing with your data is you'll be uploading data in this window because you're not going to be using your example data. But for the example I'm using for this lecture, we're just going to use this data set and, and sort of step through. So this data set, as I said, is, is from cattle, or dairy cattle, and they are given different proportions of cereal grain. Cattle are grass-loving animals. Uh, they were not designed, actually, to, to eat grain, or very much, maybe 1%. Um, and we actually give cattle grain uh, partly to um, 
allow them to produce more milk, or also to fatten them up um, just before they're slaughtered. Uh, there's a real concern in this area because, in fact, very high levels of grain have been found to cause a lot of stress in the animals and a lot of diseases in the animals. And they were interested why, uh, what's, what's leading to that. Um, so in this case, uh, they were fed different proportions of, of barley grains, mostly 0%, um, 15% of their feed, 30% of the feed, 45%, which is very, very high. And then uh, you can collect the rumen. So cattle have giant, giant stomachs, um, multi-stomachs, um, and they have ruminal fluid, and they are, this is how they're able to consume cellulose-rich material and convert it into energy. And so we used NMR spectroscopy in this case to analyze the, the data, and we had concentrations for, for about 45, 50 metabolites. So once we uh, have our data, we've selected it, the first thing that we should do is do a data integrity check. Now in this particular case we're going to skip it partly because NMR usually generates high integrity data but if you're doing GCMS or LCMS data you should check and what it'll do is it'll check um, or in fact as it's let it in it's checked to see whether uh, samples were rows, features were in columns, it'll check to see whether the data was um, um, sufficiently formatted, um, it'll identify whether things are numeric or not, um, if there's some missing values in it, um, and if, if it's all checked through, then as I say, you can skip doing any, any missing value estimations or other uh, fixes that you need to do. Yes? So that's, that's one of the things that happens in struggling with my whole data set, which is missing value. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advices or suggestions? Because I see here you said it's replaced by a very small value, which is probably the, the lower limit of the instrument. Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes it just misses, I guess, somehow. So and you can average, or is there you know, an advice or a recommendation on what we should use for missing value? So we standardly take um, the lower limit um, of detection divided by 2. And that's what we substitute in. For, for everything. Um, and that seems to work pretty well. Uh, it's also a case of how much or what proportion of missing values you have. So if you have a metabolite where, you know, 60-80% of its missing values, you might as well just delete the metabolite. It's just not, it's just adding noise. Uh, so it's sort of the proportion of missing values for a given compound is, is also a thing you have to consider. Uh, but when we've got, you know, 10 or 20% Missing values, then it's it's sort of that <coughs> lower limit divided by two. Okay, so in this case, uh, we have samples that are in rows, that's horizontal, and compounds, metabolites, in columns. So we have different options in terms of uh, this normalizing or scaling. Um, so in this one, we've chosen to create a pooled average sample from group. Um, and then in terms of the data transformation, we could have done um, log transformation, but our hints, our suggestions are, and typically this is true with NMR data, that it's fairly normally distributed. Uh, and then we look to see if there's any sort of scaling that we should be doing to adjust based on concentrations or between different things. So in this case, we've chosen auto-scaling. So these are things where intent actually is free to so go back and forth a little bit to see what, what, what really works best. So as I say, once we've got this set, you've uploaded it, or the, in this case, we've taken the available data. We have a data matrix. So samples in rows, compounds, uh, con concentrations are in the columns. And so the row-wise normalization, uh, column-wise normalization, and the combined normalization. So in the row-wise normalization that we're doing um, is, is to make, in this case, uh, compound concentration sort of uh, comparable, so to deal with dilution effects. In this case, where the the samples are in rows and compounds are in columns. Uh, in this case, the column-wise normalization is to make things uh, move to a normal distribution. So that's the, the metabolite concentrations. 
Um, and so we talked about the importance of having normal or Gaussian uh, features. And again, the different types of log transformation that are, or types of transformation that you have to do that. So here's an example uh, where you can see the distribution of metabolite concentrations here. Uh, follows what almost looks like a, an extreme or maybe even almost an exponential um, distribution. That's the thing on the left. So if we now do a log transformation for this one, as an example, you can see that the distributions of the concentrations now look Gaussian. See how the, the peak on the right, which is drawn at the bottom, has a nice bell shape to it. So this is an example of how it's sometimes very, very important to do that kind of transformation. So in some cases, you don't have to do it. Um, and the only way you can know it is to sort of look at your data. So if your data pops up and it looks like what we see on the left, then you should go back to this data normalization window and say, OK, I want to do log transformation. Try it. Let's say it still doesn't work. Say, so, okay, I, I will try another one. And it has two or three options. So those things can be done to help essentially make your, your data more compatible for t-tests and ANOVA and PCA and everything else. So this is a very important step. And a number of people will just skip it right over. Um, they won't even think or iterate back and forth to see what gives them the best distribution. Yes. Have you looked at this where you um, don't normalize it or you know normalize it different ways and um, observed how sensitive your results are to that transformation? We have a little bit, but we haven't done a really systematic study. And, and part of it is just it's sort of up to people and their data. Um, but yes, you will get changes uh, if, if you've chosen different ways of normalizing and or or converting it into a, a Gaussian-like distribution. So this is, it's an important one. Um, and if the data is, this is, in this case, very nicely distributed. So you, you, you found the, the sweet spot and, and things should be quite robust. But if you have still something that looks like it's you know, multimodal or just looks like a square curve, um, something might be seriously wrong with your data. <laughs> um, and obviously what's going to happen to it is probably not much better. Um, so as I said, this is something you can't know a priori. Um, so this is why you have to do some a bit of back and forth. So there's an interaction thing. Um, and this is why it's also important to be very clear about your protocol and how you've done this uh, so that people can reproduce it. Um, this visual inspection of saying this looks nicely normal is still kind of an intuitive thing. So there are some formal protocols that can assess the normalization, the normality of a distribution. Um, but we don't use that normally. And that's partly because I think people's eyes are usually better than sometimes the formulas. So after you've done that normalization or Gaussian log transformation and scaling so that things are relatively consistent, um, you want to look at your data a little further, and this is dealing with the, the noise, the outliers, and other things that may be problematic. So to, to find an outlier again, computer programs don't do a good job, so your eyes are best. And sometimes outliers can be, uh, are actually corrected when you do these normalization log transformations. Other cases, it's just so obvious that this is like a, you typed in three zeros instead of one zero or something like that, or you forgot to put the decimal place in. And so that way you can correct it. Um, or if you know that there's something that went wrong with the instrument, then you might as well just remove that, that outlier. And we just talked about the example of maybe a metabolite where most of them are missing values. Well, you might as well just get rid of it because there's no real information there. Um, and then there's the noise reduction, which is usually important more for raw spectra or peak list sets, uh, which is something we won't really have to deal with here. So what might an outlier look like? Well, sometimes if you've carried on and you've done a PCA analysis, and here we have you know, red and green, so there's a nice, decent cluster here. And then you've got this green thing that's just way off in left field. 
that is probably an outlier that you didn't pick up. Or you could have done hierarchical clustering, and you're seeing most everything is kind of light red, light blue, and then you see this thing that's basically black. So black streak running all the way across. Something went wrong there, maybe everything was multiplied by a thousand accidentally. Um, and so it's a matter again of going back to your data and either removing it or making sure that you don't multiply everything by a thousand. So these are ways that sort of late in the process where you can detect outliers, but other cases it might be just obvious to your eyes um, when you look at the tables. So there's an editor that allows you to deal with that issue of, of, of editing things. You could also not use the editor and, and just use your, go back to your CSV file and edit it as well. Um, then there's a data filtering step, uh, which again is more for noise reduction with lists of peaks. We don't generally have to deal with this in the case of concentration data. Um, and in terms of identifying noise, uh, there's some general rules, um, particularly with peaks and peak lists, uh, about what, what's generally noise and uninformative features. So these are things that are very, very low intensity, things that have very, very low variance. Um, and usually the low variance threshold is, is a good way of identifying noise. So these are the cleaning stages, and, and it's something that gain requires a bit of time. It's not sort of blindly upload and blindly press buttons. Um, it, it does mean that, especially with the data you guys have collected, that you're going to be spending maybe five, ten minutes just double checking your data and looking at it. Uh, maybe longer. Um, so once you've gone through those, those first steps, which are sort of the red things, then you can start doing the data reduction and statistical analysis. So with data reduction and statistical analysis, we're doing we're trying to identify important features, interesting patterns, trying to distinguish between the different phenotypes, in this case of cattle fed different proportions of cereal grain. We want to try and do some predictions or classifications. And to do these things, we'll be using three or four different tools, ANOVA, multivariate analysis, and clustering. So these are available in MetaboAnalyst, and this is the menu that you have. So there's a univariate tests, there's multivariate tests, um, and then there's the cluster analysis. And so these are marked with these arrows here. Now, why are we doing ANOVA and not t-tests? Or Well, it's because we're dealing with four populations, 0, 15, 30, and 45. So this is where you have to remember a little bit about what we talked about earlier today, that this is not case and control, <coughs> it's four populations. And with ANOVA, then, we're just simply to try and identify, you know, which ones are different from the, essentially, zero percent uh, and everything else. So that's a one-way ANOVA. We could have done two, three, or four-way ANOVA if we wish, but uh, this is just the one. So we click and uploaded the data, and you'll see an interactive plot here. And you'll also see four clusters with um, box whisker plots, uh, red, green, blue, turquoise, um, indicating, in this case, uh, the three, was it propionic acid? I can't read it. Um, that is, in this case, particularly different. And so this plot is interactive. You can click a spot, which in this case has a, a significantly different um, value um, in terms of the log p, or uh, so it's 0 0.00001 or whatever. So it's quite different between the 0% and the others. Um, we can also view this into a table. Um, so again, there's a, a region, internet region, which you can click. And when you click on that, you can actually see these plots. Um, um, and you can look at other compounds um, on this list to see how different they are uh, and what the results are with respect to ANOVA. Again, the interactivity is important as well as the, the graphs that are also clickable. So in this case, with this set of data, uh, you could explore it. And, and I'd encourage actually some of you to go and use these things. Um, you know, just what I've done, I'm skipping through because I'm not showing it live. But you can do this and use this as a 
this sort of your first tutorial. So look at which compounds are most different or most similar between the four different cattle groups. Uh, you can also go to the correlation link and actually generate a heat map to look at the compound correlations. And so this is the type of heat map that's automatically generated. And you can save that um, as a PNG or PDF file. And if you're doing that, you can select the type uh, of, of file, quality and, and image density. So <coughs> In some cases, if you're looking at two populations, uh, especially more than two populations, uh, you might want to like to see if there's certain trends. Now, it could be groups or populations, or it even could be over time. So, beginning, middle, end, three points. And so, um, metaboanalyst has a pattern hunting utility uh, to look for certain trends. So, we have a linear trend where it just keeps on increasing for one particular metabolite. Uh, depending on 0, 15, 30, 45%. Or you might find something that goes up and then drops down or, or the reverse. So these are patterns. And so with a pattern matching, you can try and look for things that, that match these sort of predetermined patterns, which might be linear or periodic or square well-based. Um, and this, as I say, is usually when you've got three, four, five, or six groups and so with that, you can actually look to see, you've chosen a pattern, and say which ones actually most match that pattern. In this case, we're looking for a linear pattern where they go up one, two, three, four in those two groups. And what we see is that in this case, endotoxin and glucose are strongly linearly correlated. Uh, but then we have some other ones like um, ethanol and formate, which do not seem to have any linear trends. Uh, and then we have a negative linear trend with 3PP, um, which is you know just the opposite. So this is allowing us to look for, as I say, patterns that, that might be informative. Um, and is again useful when we've got three or four or five populations or looking at three or four or five different time periods. So that was essentially doing analysis of variants. Um, there are other options we could have done. Um, now we'll look at the principal component analysis. And in this case, we're just simply saying, do these things separate? Um, and we can look at a 2D or a 3D PCA score plot. We can look at the loadings plot. We could also look at it in 3D, where we're now looking at more, well, three principal components. So here's what it looks like. We've labeled things, uh, just to make it a little clearer. Um, but you can see that there is some separation from the P in this PCA plot. Um, and we're looking at actually four groups, and they're colored. So the this ellipsoids cover most of the, the points in these groups. Um, and we can kind of see a trend where they separate more from top right corner to lower left corner is the sort of the trend in terms of the separation. And so if we look at the loadings plot, then we can look at those two trends, that is the top right and lower left corners, and, and those metabolites that are in the top left, lower right, are the things that are driving the separation. And so we'll click on some of these points, and in fact we see that you know 3PP is one of them, and then I suspect it's um, um, glucose uh, is another um, that, that's driving the separation. So that's in the 2D view. We could do, do this in a 3D score plot, and this is interactive, so you can use your mouse and click and drag and rotate. Uh, you can mouse over things to see some of the sample metabolite names and so on. So this is relatively new for metaboanalysts. So these are the enhancements that have happened over the last uh, year or two with new, new visualization tools and improvements to R and, and to the web systems that are available. So we see separation. That's a good sign. Um, that usually says, well, let's go the next step forward to see if we can get enhanced separation. This is where the PLSDA is, is useful. And remember the cautions about using it, because it's a powerful and easily abused function. So in this case, we've got uh, PLSDA. Things are obviously labeled, because we've marked them as a label. And as I said, PLSDA sort of takes the original PCA axes and, and rotates them in a weird way to, to maximize the separation. 
And we can kind of look at the, the different values, the Q squared, the R squared, the VIP plots, and so on. So here is what we get uh, with this PLSDA. So in fact, if you recall what the PCA plot looked like, it, you know, separation not great, but evident. Now with this PLSDA plot, you can see quite significant separation. So we've rotated things in a convenient way that, that maximizes that separation. We can then look at the uh, Q squared and R squared values, and I can't see this, but both of them uh, look to have or, or the Q squared and R squared are both greater than 0 0.7. So this suggests that, that the, PC, the PLSDA plot is robust. The separations that we're seeing are, are real and robust. What's driving the separation? Um, well, not unexpectedly, we see 3PP, endotoxin, and glucose, which is the same things that were driving the separation we originally saw in the, in the PCA plot. So this is the VIP plot, and it's a little different than the ones I was showing you before, which had sort of two colors. Um, this is the one that's indicating high to low regions, um, and you can basically see the pattern in these four groups. Um, and if you see a sort of a nice rainbow color that goes from red to orange to yellow to green, um, that shows a, you know, a specific trend. Uh, others, you might see you know, red, red, green, green, which might show another different type of trend between the two groups. Um, so this is just showing the trend, but it's also identifying, and it's sort of cut off in terms of the VIP scores, but I think these are you know, two and three and four, so they're fairly significant. And um, what, as I say, the PLSDA is just simply reiterating what we probably initially saw in the PCA but it's just making it a little more obvious. However, you know, R squared, Q squared, you know, is 0.7 great. You know, the suggestion is if it's great 0.5, it's good. But I prefer to do permutation analysis whenever I'm doing PLSDA. And so in this case, we've done the permutation analysis. It's 2,000, I think. I can't just read the number. Is it only 100? I can't remember. Maybe it's 100. So it runs it 100 times, calculates all these things, and you can see based on the distribution with this that the separation, the one that was correctly labeled, just is way, way far away from all the others. So this clearly shows that that's a, a very significant um, and robust PLSD result. So you can set the numbers. As I say, the default here was 100. You can go up to about 2,000. That's a lot. Um, um, and I think the advice probably from Jeff would be choose a lower number first, and if, if it doesn't look significant, choose a little higher number um, to see if you can get better statistics. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's some kind of value that I think combines Q squared and P squared R squared together. So accuracy is just based on prediction. That's a machine learning thing. How many times you predict that in the right class? That's another thing. Well, what it can tell you, let's say, what kind of value is that's just a, a whatever you're comfortable. For the people using PRSDA, uh, they usually use Q square, R square. But for machine learning, they actually prefer accuracy. How many times they predict it right? So it's uh, uh, sometimes it's oh, and mo most time it's follow the same in the trend. So I, I guess it would be almost equivalent to a, a rock curve performance for um, sensitivity specificities for moving these things and. Uh, the number of components that you're using in this rock curve model increases, and so the rock curve, probably close to what the area under the curve would be. So you can think of it sort of like that. And so here's it's just using one component to try and distinguish between the different um, um, cattle, and then if you use two components or three components or four components, it progressively gets better. Um, can I say something? Yeah, the, the thing with that many components that uh, when you get too many components, uh, performance can improve, but if Q value actually dropped slightly in that figure, so that means it's probably overfitting based on the uh, 
uh, Q-square, but based on the uh, accuracy, it seems still improving. That's uh, uh, not all the time they agree with each other, but it's based on whatever you're comfortable because there's two different cultures, statistics and the machine learning. That's uh, it's give you the choice, but uh, you just see. Yeah, I know some software, they just stop once you Q-square starting to decrease the software and the performance. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, here it allows you to specify by default it uh, testing from one, two, three, four, five. But you can uh, you can try to increase. And once they say to stop increasing, you can now you, you see it's best model, right? Based on accuracy or Q value. So there's three components, as I said, are the three PP endotoxin and glucose, uh, which are the ones that seem to be. And then you can see that there's not much to distinguish between, I guess, it alanine and methylamine. Um, from the glucose, so the performance isn't enhanced a whole lot more as you go beyond the three or four components. Um, so that's the PLSDA, uh, we've seen the PCA, and then we can do a little bit more in terms of the, the heat maps uh, or clustering. Yes? Are there any um, ROC curves on this or periodic yeah. curves? Or yeah but not with this particular one that we're, example that we're using. Um, so um, under the cluster analysis, uh, we can do the heat map. Uh, we'll use the hierarchical clustering one, which is generally preferred. Um, and it, it allows you to look at the behavior of metabolites, and you can ask questions, which ones have a low concentration in the 0 and 15, but increase in the 35 and 45 which compound is the only one that's significantly increased in the, the 45 group. So those are things that, again, a visualization tool like a heat map can, can allow you to look at that. Why you might ask those questions, who knows, but these are examples of, of things that you might might do. And so clicking on this down the, the um, panels allows you to generate that. Uh, you can cluster on the rows or order by class labels, whatever. Um, this is what it looks like. Looks like we've got some pretty good color range here, but uh, you can see the red, green, blue, turquoise above. So those are the four populations. And then you can see the clustering of the metabolites um, down below. Uh, again, you can cluster with the heat map in different ways. Um, and with you know, both above and below or to the, the top and to the side. Um, so Again, it's just a, a different way of looking at data. Uh, it can be informative depending on how you want to look at it. Um, some people really prefer this kind of view over, say, PCA or PLSDA. But it's still a, a matter of choice and then giving people that choice. So what we've been doing is you know, a, a sample run. Uh, and most of it would take much less time than what I've done in terms of explaining things. But we're obviously trying to make sure you can understand what's going on. So we've done most of the multivariate analysis, but it's been tracking all of this information, all the plots, all the graphs that we've generated. So what's really nice about metabolanalysis is that it's actually kept records of all of those things, and so you can print off or save as a PDF a summary of what you've done and what you've found. And so these are the results, and these are the things that have been generated. and. Um, and you can get this full PDF report. And uh, if we looked at it, this is what it looks like. So it's, it's written your paper for you. Um, and you just have to submit it off to, to Nature and you're finished. Um, so that's, that's an example analysis of, of, of Metabolanalyst. Um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I say something? So for your question, the, your last one, the latest one, is going to be put on the report. So if you're doing a okay. uh, heat map 10 times, the only last one will be stay there because overriding, overriding. Otherwise, you're going to be very long and you don't know. So if you want to click uh, download, so your last uh, operation, make sure this is the one you want. Yeah. Does that help? 
Okay. Um, so we've done sort of the, the statistical analysis. We could also do an enrichment analysis. Um, so that's one of the other options that are available. And so this is based on a concept called metabolite set enrichment analysis, or MSEA, and that's based on something that's been around for microarrays and gene expression analysis for almost a decade, so-called gene set enrichment analysis. And there are three options in MSEA. So this is over-representation analysis, aura, single sample profiling, and then quantitative enrichment analysis. So to do this sort of thing, you actually have to have a, a number of libraries or databases. So GSEA has very large libraries that large community contributes. Uh, metabolomics is much smaller but uh, in terms of community, but it has a whole bunch of predefined metabolite sets, pathway sets, and disease sets that have been generated. Partly from the metabolomics database, but also from some so the HMDB as well as some data mining that Jeff has done. So it's, it's really to see if there's some bio biologically meaningful groups of metabolites that are significant. Um, it's, we're looking at pathways, disease, and localization. Because all this information has been mined from human data, it, MSEA is really restricted to human metabolomic data. But it probably could be converted or translated to mammalian data pretty well. So it's, uh, except some of the concentration values may not match for mice and rats. Um, so with um, MSEA, you can actually just have a bunch of metabolite names. No, not any concentrations, just the metabolites. So these are ones that somehow you've identified by, you know, relative concentrations or just there or not there uh, by some simple assay. And then that allows you to do over-representation analysis. Um, other sets, you could actually have a single patient in this case um, and a list of their metabolite names and their concentrations. So this is a single sample. So you want to have a metabolomics test, just like if you want to go to 23andMe and have a, a SNP test. Um, and here's you know 110 metabolites that up from your urine sample. What's normal and what's abnormal? So this is what SSP does. Um, now the next one, which is if you've got a you know cohort study, so the whole room is being studied here, and we might be doing cases and controls, or but in this one it's a more extensive one where we've got not only metabolite names and concentrations, but also for a whole bunch of people in a clinical test. So three types: ORA, SSP, and QEA, and they need different types of input. Uh, Aura is really simple input and you know a modestly powerful technique. SSP is for sort of your own personalized uh, assessment uh, and interpretation. Then the QEA is, is for sort of a, a large-scale study of multiple people. So for this, we've chosen a study that was done a few years back by our group uh, looking at, at lung and colon cancer patients who developed cachexia. So this is a form of muscle wasting. And if any of you have known people who've had cancer, often in later stages, um, they look very, very thin. And that's, that's called cachexia. And uh, it happens for certain types of cancers, uh, not for all. And if it happens to develop, the outcomes are much worse for those. And we still don't know why it happens. And for some people who have lung cancer, uh, cachexia never develops. Uh, and so those people actually live quite long and reasonably uh, um, morbidity-free lives. Uh, but um, those that do, lives are significantly shortened. So we'd like to know more about the metabolic basis of cachexia, and so this is why the study was done. So you can select that sample set. It's a data example set. Um, and in this case, once we've selected it, we can choose the enrichment analysis. And in this case, we could upload a compound set. Um, and I say aura is, is a weak analysis. So here's just a list of compounds. Um, and we wanted to try over enrichment analysis. T for it to work, it has to have some name standardization. And so in this case, um, one of the compounds 
uh, was misspelled and it's not able to map it to anything in CAG or HMDB and so it flags it and says what have you done is this a real metabolite um, so once it's identified that then we can try and fix isoleucine and spell it correctly and once that's done then you know it suggests things but it, it's once it's done we can um, check it then we can choose what sort of metabolite library we want to compare this list of metabolites to so we could look at a pathway library a disease library a SNP associated library predicted metabolite set location based sets in this case we've chosen a pathway uh, library and based on those metabolites that were altered or at least from our initial set of metabolites that seem to be significant by whatever we, way we chose we see that there's a number of pathways that were chosen so glycine serine tryptophan metabolism is altered protein biosynthesis is altered phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism is altered methionine metabolism is altered ammonia recycling is, is altered these are all significantly changed based on their representation in known pathways and this is actually quite striking because it's, it's quite consistent with what we know about the metabolism associated with cachexia so this is being picked up and then we can go in and dive in and see what what's actually there uh, with these table values we can see the false discovery rate so this is the FDR corrected value uh, compare that to the P value uh, which is not corrected for false discovery so remember we're doing many comparisons so these are statistically robust measures of what's significant uh, we can go a little further and after we've clicked on these things so once we clicked view we can look to see a pathway that's associated with this particular case this uh, phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism and this is linked to SMIPDB and so this is a phenylalanine tyrosine pathway uh, which highlights the things that are there where it works alterations largely in the liver um, where the metabolites go so that's aura so it's a fairly simple-minded analysis single sample profiling this is as I say something that you would do if you were a physician and you wanted to characterize uh, someone or if you happen to want to know what your what's happening with your metabolites and so it's just for you or for a single person and here's a list of their metabolites and their concentrations so is there anything abnormal and this is a typical thing that would be done in a urine test, except that in clinical urine tests, they only measure seven things. So this is typically reading out, I don't know, 100 or so. So all this does is just look at the known concentrations uh, to normal values. And so there's very extensive data on normal values for blood and urine in humans. And so it's just running through and saying, what does it look like? Is it within the realm? And um, it's... Um, conducting comparisons you can see it a little more and then you can also have that plotted out uh, based on other known studies and where your value is and you can certainly see in the case of threonine for this patient or this person uh, it's way high what does it mean well that's sort of what it'll comment about or reference information may be there a step further so going beyond just a single person now you're looking at a cohort this is where you use QEA so this would be for you know large scale study again for humans more clinical um, and again there's various options that you can select and once you've chosen you can submit it so we're collecting all 77 patient samples and just running it through and the result is is not unlike what we get with um, aura. Um, but it, it identifies some other things in a bit more detail and it's identifying issues with galactose metabolism which didn't pop, pop before um, it's also identifying issues with insulin signaling uh, but it's also still showing issues with some of the branch chain amino acid and, and essential amino acid metabolism that's altered in cachexia and again there are graphs that you can view um, and, and it can go down several levels and you can also match up to the different pathways through SMIPDB so MSCA is intended for human studies, so it's not for plants, not for microbial. Uh, it could work reasonably well with some other mammalian systems, um, but it's really oriented for clinical work. Question. So is
way to use that to see what tablets people are actually submitting. So there would be like markers showing up that's like everybody gets it for every disease and every study that you can identify that that's just like shows up in everybody's study. Yeah, so again, just for the question, uh, are, are, is there a way you can identify metabolites that show up very, very frequently as being important uh, in, in disease indications for nearly every study? Um, that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, we're working on a database called MarkerDB, uh, which is trying to track um, uh, biomarkers as published in the literature for a whole bunch of conditions and to try and measure the incidence of those compounds to see if they're just you know something that always shows up. Uh, one example that does show up almost all the time uh, are uh, carnitines and acyl carnitines. Um, and um, these are actually markers of uh, inflammation and white blood cell activity. So if you're sick, usually your white blood cells are active. And, and so that can be for anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what you're seeing with elevated acyl carnitines is essentially a, a high activity of white blood cells. So it's, it's not a very specific marker, but it is a marker for something that's going, your body's not happy. Um, I know that in our early days we kept on finding acyl carnitines, but we were very excited with, the, oh, this is a very specific set of markers. Now it turns out that there are some classes of acyl carnitines that seem to be specific for certain conditions. So as a broad category, acyl carnitines are not informative, but as uh, specific acyl carnitines, there may be some um, very unique or specific conditions. So yeah, it's still evolving. I think people need to um, you know, address that question more thoroughly. OK, I'm going to jump to another module. So we've done statistics, we've done enrichment analysis, and now we can look into pathway analysis. So pathway analysis isn't restricted to humans. It's actually supported for a number of model organisms. So mice, fruit flies, Arabidopsis, E. coli yeast. And the pathway analysis is able to work because it builds on the keg pathways, which cover a large number of organisms. So pathway analysis goes a step beyond uh, metabolite set enrichment analysis because it's able to look at other um, organisms, but it's also a way of looking at the biology, the pathways. Now I'm going to put in a caveat here, and, and this is a very important one for a lot of people, and it's fundamentally a weakness in, in metabolomics overall. <coughs> Almost all pathway databases that are out there, and KEG in particular, focus on catabolism and anabolism, so breakdown or construction of other metabolites. So that's our classical view of metabolism. But metabolites are far more important than that. And what's not depicted in most pathways is the signaling role that metabolites have. And you can think of glucose as being one of the most important signaling molecules in the body. And if you look at glucose in keg, it just simply shows it in glycolysis. But glucose activates all kinds of things. It's a target, uh, or uh, it targets many, many proteins. And it's tightly controlled by many systems and proteins as well. None of those are depicted in KEG. A few of them are in SNPDB. Um, acylcarnitine, something that I mentioned. These are the byproducts of white blood cell activity, yet go to KEG no mention of immune function or white blood cell activity. It simply is used in beta oxidation of fatty acids. So again, it doesn't link to a physiological important uh, pathway or process. Leucine, isoleucine, very important branch to chain amino acids. Those amino acids target um, mTOR um, and are critical and function essentially as insulin analogs. Insulin leads to all kinds of signaling events and all kinds of physiological processes. Do you see that pathway in keg? No. 
So elevations in branched chain amino acids, people simply will interpret them through KEG and say, oh, well, this, you know, it's involved in synthesizing branched chain amino acids, and here's some other compounds. It tells you nothing. <coughs> so this is a fundamental weakness of pathway analysis and of pathways in general and pathway databases. And until metabolomics gets to the state where the pathways that it offers provide some of this physiologically important information like leucine and isoleucine or insulin analogs or that glucose is an important signaling molecule that targets you know, 500 other proteins. And until that's there, people are going to have some very, very shallow interpretation of metabolite data. And it's still the way it is. People just keep on saying, oh, I found isoleucine and leucine and cool, that's amino acid synthesis. It's useful for making muscle. End of story. And that's as I say, that's a useless result. And those pathways are important for, you know, not just humans. All mammals probably largely function as well for any, any system that has uh, B cells and T cells. So those are all things that can go all the way down to any multicellular organism. Pathways in terms of signaling for unicellular organisms also are, are lacking. So the operon pathways and E. coli do you find them in keg? No. Um, do you find uh, second messenger signaling and, and quorum sensing signaling in, in, in keg? No. So these are all examples of fundamental metabolite measurements that, that, and metabolites where we don't have pathways that are absolutely vital to understanding how systems work. Okay, I'm going to have to speed up here. Um, but it, it's, it's a, certainly a pet peeve of mine and one that I think you guys who are young and full of energy uh, need to think about. So in this case, we're going to use the same lung colon cancer set uh, to do pathway analysis. And so we've selected it, uh, we choose the pathway analysis, we upload our data as before. Um, because there's data with concentrations, we have to do a little bit of data normalization, just like what we did with the PCA. So we could do some log transformation or auto scaling, other things. And this is how we've chosen to do it here. And again, this is through trial and error that we found this is the best. Uh, and then we can choose our pathway library. Uh, so we can look at, you know, uh, mouse or parasites or plants. In this case, obviously working for humans, so we choose humans. Um, and then we can do uh, a couple of analysis. We can look at network topology analysis, and we can use all of the pathways, and we can use uh, both assessments of pathway enrichment and pathway topology. And we can measure things by relative betweenness or out degree centrality. Uh, with enrichment analysis, we can use a global test uh, or a global ANCOVA test. So in the case of topology, position matters. And this is this idea of hubs um, and non-hubs or nodes, bottlenecks. And if you're thinking of these sort of clusters or pathways here, something that then marked in blue represents um, a major bottleneck. Um, and then the, the red ones represent hubs. So this is a form of graph theory, and this has been fairly well developed over the last 10 years. And um, it's been used in mathematics for decades. Um, but it's a way of assessing positions in, in pathways. So the nodes that we talked about have a high degree of centrality, uh, or rather the hubs have a high degree of centrality. And then the bottlenecks have what we call high betweenness centrality. So that's sort of a quantitative way of talking about hubs and bottlenecks. So that's the topology, but then you can go to sort of the pathway um, uh, enrichment uh, analysis. And so you can get these kinds of plots, which uh, plot the impact uh, of the pathway and a log p in terms of significance. And so this produces sort of a, a modestly correlated graph that goes from you know, light yellow to dark red and goes from left corner to top corner in terms of the importance of the pathway. So usually the things that are off on the far top corner are the ones that are most important. So based on pathway analysis, the glycine serine threonine metabolism was the most important for this one. 
So it's a little different than what we got with our metabolite set enrichment analysis, but um, again, this is having to deal with pathways and thinking of pathways in this way with, with concentration data. And so um, you can go in, zoom in, you can click on things, it provides graphs. This measure of pathway impact includes log fold change uh, and the differentially expressed metabolites, statistical significance, the set of pathway um, genes and proteins, and the topology. So it's all sort of combined together, which is a little different than the metabolite set enrichment. Um, and it uses both topology and over-representation analysis. You can get tables, and you can link this both to KEG databases and in this case, because it's human, also the Small Molecule Pathway Database, or SMPDB. Statistics are there. False discovery rate information is there. Um, so it's, again, quite statistically robust. Um, when we're doing biomarker analysis, uh, there's often two things that people worry about, uh, whether it's, well, in this case, I clicked power analysis, so that maybe I should have clicked the biomarker analysis. So the idea is to find biomarkers using rock curves. So we've learned about rock curves and we want to do uh, a process where we maximize the area under the curve and minimize the number of metabolites. So this is similar to that Q-squared accuracy plot or the discussion we had earlier where we see that after adding you know, more than three or four metabolites the accuracy really isn't improving and the Q-squared starts falling. So it's the same sort of thing with uh, biomarker analysis. We're trying to choose a model uh, and it could be a PLSDA model, it could be an SVM model, or something that classifies things. Um, and so that classification is, is typically that multivariate model. Some people have some really good intuition about what the biomarker sh should be, so biomarker analysis in, in this rock curve tool allows you to do manual analysis. You can also look at one variable at a time and see which one is contributing uh, in terms of a discriminating factor. So in this case, um, we're not going to be using the cows and we're not going to be using the cancer set. We're going to choose another panel of 90 patients, expectant mothers, at three months pregnancy. And in this case, we're trying to identify which ones went on to develop preeclampsia and which ones had normal pregnancies. So this is actually to try and come up with a rock curve to predict preeclampsia. So just like with the PCA analysis, we have to do a you know, data integrity check. Is everything A-OK? -okay? And yes, it was. So we can skip things. Then we can do some data normalization and scaling. So in this case, um, it has a lot of both NMR and I think MS data. So we have to do a log transformation to, to make it look better. And again, this is what it looks like before. So notice this highly skewed... Um, sort of Poisson-like distribution, and then you do the log transformation, and it looks very much like a, a nice normal distribution. So now we've got it sorted out, um, then we can get into the realm of doing this multivariate rock curve analysis. So what it's going to do is sample uh, of the you know dozens and dozens of metabolites for these 90 different patients. It's going to try and choose a set of metabolites that discriminates between those who developed um, preeclampsia and those that didn't. So it's going to use uh, some machine learning methods. Uh, I think this one uses an SVM. Um, and it's going to pick out which ones are best and it's going to try different models. And in this case, we get rock curves even with just two components that have an area under the curve of, of 97%. And then if you use up to uh, 10 components, you're up to like 98, 98.5%. Then if you start using too many, then your performance starts falling. So there's an optimum one, and roughly if you want to look for, you know, maximizing benefit for, in terms of minimal number of measurements, it's somewhere around three to five compounds gives you your best performance. Um, what are those compounds? Well, again, you can sort of look at that. You can also assess, and it does essentially, um, here it's doing an SVM. We could have done a PLSDA. Um, but you want to have a measure of, of sort of reliability. Um, and this plots out um, sort of the maximum and minimum performance for this type of, of, of model uh, and gives you a spread or estimate. And this is not done enough in, in rock curve analysis. So this is something that I think is, is important to do. 
Um, from there, you can identify the significant features, which moves you into sort of the VIP plot. And the case here that distinguishes um, people who will develop preeclampsia, it's, it's four or five metabolites, so glycerol, I think there's hydroxybutyrate, choline, acetate are the ones that are most significant. Um, and in one case, they're elevated, others, they're decreased. Um, so this, again, allows you to come up with a, both a model and a predictive tool to classify or identify or predict which individuals will develop this disease based on, on their blood samples. So that was the biomarker analysis. Then the power analysis, uh, which is a mistake on the other slide, uh, is what we could look at. And this is this thing that people use not sure why this slide gets corrupted, um, of determining whether a, a study has, uh, the size of the study um, in terms of the number of patients uh, should be used, or whether the study that you've already designed has the power to, um, to, to have a real effect or, or to identify these important differences. So it's, again, a quantifiable thing where you say, you know, do you want to have an 80% chance of coming up with something that's statistically significant? Do you want a 90% or a 99% chance of something that comes up statistically significant? If I've chosen and I've got 20 mice and that's all I have, is this, how powerful is the study based on my results? How confident can I be? So statistical power depends on sample size, it depends on your choice of alpha, 0.05, and it depends on the effect size. Um, so it can increase the power by increasing the sample size, increasing the effect size. If you decrease your significance criteria, um, then that also decreases the power of the study. Um, so there are different criteria, issues with both false discovery rates or p-values that you can use. Um, you can make choices and in essence to do a power study you basically have to have some pilot data. Um, and if you've got some initial pilot data then you can start figuring out based on the curve how much more data you need to get a much more powerful um, sample. So in this case we've generated some pilot data from a few things and based on the pilot data, the curve that the power versus sample size, it says that we need about 60 samples per group to get uh, an 80 percent power. So this again suggests what you will need to do in terms of designing a future study that was based on the pilot study to make a, a more statistically robust assay. So power calculations are typically used for validation studies. They're done after you've done your discovery. Um, so most times you can't, if you're doing something for the first time, you can't do a power calculation. And if someone asks you to do so, tell them they're nuts. They're nuts. It's just, it's not possible. So we haven't covered everything here. Uh, we haven't looked at k-means clustering or self-organizing feature maps. We didn't get into random forests, or too much discussion on SVM. We didn't look at time series data. We didn't look at two-factor data. We didn't do gene and metabolite integration. But these are actually very powerful tools in the time series analysis. There's some examples here of what's possible, whether you get Venn diagrams or, or other kinds of cool plots. Um, uh, the integrated pathway analysis, which combines both genomic or transcriptomic and metabolomic data as part of a package that Jeff developed called INMEX. And I think there's a couple of you who are interested in combining those sorts of things, but unfortunately we don't have the time and the data sets to, to really do that. But you're certainly welcome to, to explore that with Metaboanalyst. Okay, so I think that covers uh, an overview of Metaboanalyst. Um, what we're hoping you guys will do over the next few hours, even if you want to start during lunch or not, um, but certainly during the lab, is to explore these things. There's lots of tools, there's example data sets that you could try, uh, but many of you probably are anxious to work on some of the data sets you, you generated yesterday. Um, and the idea here was just to show you those 
pieces uh, that you would typically want to use. And there's different paths that you may choose to follow, different things that may provide you with more information or less. Um, most of the sample sets that we've worked with, uh, at least two were human <coughs> studies, uh, one other was a mouse study, so that based on that it kind of limits what sort of paths you can have or choose in terms of the analysis uh, schema. And as I say, you don't have to work exclusively with the data we generated yesterday. You could work with the example data sets. Uh, and as you'll see in the later labs, there'll be some questions you can tackle or things you can explore to help um, better understand metaboanalyst. Okay, so are there any questions in the last minute or two before lunch?